Good morning, Woods Edge. Good to be with you, at least online. We're coming to you live this morning. Last week we tried recording on Saturday morning, and that's fine, but we thought we'd be in the moment and just record live. So we're right here with you. Church, I want you to know that as your pastor, I am praying for you during this season, for your health and protection, for jobs and financial provision, that, that we would all trust the Lord, trust God, and love people, which is our catch words during this season. Trust God, love people. May this COVID-19 crisis be our finest hour as a church. May we rise up as a church and be the church. May we be alert to the leadings of the Holy Spirit, and may each of us make the most of the opportunity, as we're told in Ephesians 5.15. I'm encouraged, church, to hear of examples of the way you are loving people during this season. Just one example this morning. Melody Chandler, many of you know her. She led the special needs ministry orphanage in China. And she and her husband, Chen, and her kids that she had adopted, one of them biologically, her kids, they had to leave China because the persecution arose, got worse a couple years ago. She posted this week on Instagram, this afternoon, we finally started our Love God, Trust God, Love People project for our neighbors. I'd been prepping all week, and today we made our all-natural hand sanitizer and started out gift-gifting, our gift-giving. We hope to be able to pray for a lot of neighbors this week, but we also practiced social distancing and left the gift on their doorstep. So way to go, Melody and kids. Now, church, let me remind you the words of A.W. Tozier. A scared world needs a fearless church, and so may God give us grace. This morning, church, we come to Acts 8, where the early church is experiencing crisis also. They have a crisis of persecution. And they too are scattered. They are scattered from Jerusalem to the surrounding region. We are scattered from large gatherings to our own homes, often from the workplaces to our homes. And our passage this morning is both relevant and it is puzzling. But before I begin reading it, let me remind you that we're dealing with the Samaritans, the age-old enemies of the Jews. Samaria is the region just north of Jerusalem, uh, roughly the area of the West Bank today in Israel. Now, the Samaritans were half Jewish, half Gentile. They had accepted the first five books of the Bible as Scripture, but not the rest of the Old Testament. Moreover, they did not worship at the temple in Jerusalem, but they had their own temple on Mount Gerizim. So they have a different Bible and a different temple, and both of these were highly offensive to the Jews. Now, the Samaritans and Jews had been estranged for each other for about a thousand years at this time in the first century. They had nothing to do with each other. Yet, in Acts 1.8, the final words Jesus said, he looks his disciples in the eyes and he says to them, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the gospel is now going out to the Samaritans for the first time. And I'm going to read the first paragraph of our passage. It's going to begin in Acts 8, verse 9. And I'll read the first paragraph at the outset. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when 
They believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. This is the Word of God, church. So Philip is preaching the gospel in Samaria, and many Samaritans are believing they are coming to Christ and getting baptized. And there was a man there by the name of Simon we just read about him who had practiced magic. In fact, he amazed people with his magic. And it is possible that Simon was a master illusionist fooling the people like in ancient day David Copperfield, or perhaps it was not an illusion, but it was demonic power. But he himself was claiming to be somebody great, and the people around him were agreeing with him about this. He did not have humility. Uh, people around were saying, this man is the power of God. That is called great. But here is the fascinating thing, is that many Samaritans are believing the gospel, and Simon himself comes to faith, and he is baptized. Moreover, Simon himself is amazed when he sees the miracles that God does through Philip. You see that in verse 13, and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he, Simon, was amazed. So either Simon was an illusionist and he recognized this is the power of God, or he was accessing the demonic power and he's recognizing, oh, this power is God's power. It's so much greater. But he was amazed at what God was doing through Philip. Now, imagine all of this going on. Can you feel the sense? Say you're there in the city and people are coming to Christ left and right. Even Simon uh, has come to faith and is baptized and miracles are being performed. So imagine the excitement, the intoxicated, carbonated atmosphere. And in the midst of all of this, we see that people are getting baptized left and right. Now, all through the New Testament... People get baptized when they believe. There are no unbaptized believers in the New Testament. Now, let me be clear about baptism. It does not save us, but it is simply a symbol that we have been saved. My wedding ring does not make me married to Gail. It is a symbol that we have been married. Both of the two symbols in the New Testament for worship, communion and baptism, are symbols, simple, physical Symbols in communion that we'll take a bit later. The bread is a pointer to the body of Christ, the broken, crucified body of Christ on the cross. The cup is a pointer to the blood of Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus. And so communion every week rivets our attention back on the cross. Remember the cross. That's how we get saved, through the shed blood of Jesus, through the crucified death of Jesus. That's communion. Baptism symbolizes that we have been identified with Christ just like my wedding ring, that we have been immersed into Christ, joined to Christ. We are Lord in baptism. We are Lord under the water, symbol of the fact that we are buried with Christ. We're dead with Christ. We're identified with Christ. He took our sin. And then we're raised up out of the water, symbolizing that we're raised with Christ in a new life and forgiveness of sins. Now, let me say, if you have not been baptized since you have trusted Christ as your Savior, then by all means get baptized. Our next baptism will be July 5th. You can email baptisms, plural, baptisms at woodsedge.org to sign up. That's in July 5th. Now, many of you at Woods Edge were baptized as an infant. In fact, I think more people at Woods Edge came from one of the infant baptism traditions than one of those traditions that practice believer's baptism. That is, you get baptized after you believe. Now, if you were baptized as an infant, I urge you to get baptized now as a believer, which does not nullify what your parents did for you as an infant, but rather it fulfills and confirms the promise of what your parents did. So I would urge you to get baptized. In the New Testament, people, you see it all through, trusted Christ, and then they were baptized as a symbol that they belonged to Christ. Okay, 
Now, in verse 14, we come to a new movement in the passage where we read, Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down. Remember, Jerusalem is high, 2,500 feet. He came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them. But they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, there are two puzzling questions in this passage. First, why did the Jerusalem church feel the need to send two apostles to the Samaritan when Philip was already there sharing the gospel, and quite effectively? Secondly, why did the Samaritans not receive the Holy Spirit when they came to Christ like every other believer does? They do not receive the Holy Spirit until Peter and John come from Jerusalem and lay hands on them. We'll look at these two questions briefly. First of all, why did the Jerusalem church feel the need to send two apostles to the Samaritans? Now, keep in mind, the key here is the age-old hostility between Jews and Samaritans. And God did not want the Samaritans to come to faith and start a separate church. There is only one church in Christ, not two churches. The unity of the body of Christ was at stake, given their historical relationship. So that's why the church in Jerusalem with the apostles send their top two apostles, Peter and John, to Samaria. They were making sure that there was no division between Jews and Samaritans. They are protecting the unity of the church because of this thousand-year hostility. Okay, that's the first question. The second question is uh, along the same lines. Why did not the Samaritans believe, why did not the Samaritan believers receive the Holy Spirit at the moment they trusted Christ? Now, this is the way it has been for every other person who trusts Christ since Acts 2, Pentecost. In Acts 2, God pours out the Holy Spirit on the church, and all the believers there received the Spirit. We now live in the age of the Spirit, the age of the church, and whenever we trust Christ as Savior, in that moment, God does many things to us, including He gives us the Holy Spirit in sight. For example, in Romans 8 9, we read this crystal clear statement, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ, does not belong to Him. Now, if you do not have the Holy Spirit inside you, you're not a believer. And of course, the converse is true. If you are a believer, then you have the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit indwells you from the moment you trust Christ as Savior. Also, another completely clear reference would be 1 Corinthians 12, 13, where we read that for... In one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. So here, we come to what's known in the New Testament as the spirit baptism. We've got water baptism, a symbol, but we've got the reality of spirit baptism that happens the moment we trust Christ. What happens? Well, it says right here, we were all baptized into one body, spirit baptizes us, immerses us, identifies us into the body of Christ. We're believers. You cannot be in the body of Christ without the Holy Spirit. Now, this is true of everyone since Pentecost in Acts 2, except the Samaritans in Acts 8. I mean, what's going on here? Why are they an exception? Well, the answer goes back to what we've just seen. There has been this deep rift between Jews and Samaritans for a thousand years. They had nothing to do with each other. And God is underscoring that they are now joined together in one body. And it is not until the apostles come from Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church, lay hands on the Samaritans, that the Spirit is bestowed upon them. Because God is emphasizing there is one church and only one church. In fact, that is an emphatic teaching throughout the New Testament. The last prayer of Jesus in John 17, 
He only prays one thing for the future church, and that is that we would be one. We'd be one. We'd be one. Unity, love matters so much to God. That's one reason why we pray here at Woods Edge for another church every week. We are underscoring there's only one church in the city. We're partners, teammates. That's one reason why we collaborate with other Christ-honoring churches throughout the city, including the Houston Church Planning Network. Tomorrow morning, the Houston Church Planning Network, this collaboration of well over 100 churches in Houston. Together, we train church planners. I serve on the board of Houston Church Planning Network. Tomorrow, we'll launch a 50-day prayer vigil to uh, prepare for Easter. And it'll go to pastors throughout the city. And we will have share these prayer devotionals. We're together for the body of Christ. So, so um, that's why they did not receive the Holy Spirit until the apostles came from Jerusalem because there's one church. Jack Deere, who was supposed to come to Wood's Edge at the end of March, in fact, he was supposed to be here today, he's uh, had a prominent ministry with the Holy Spirit around the world through his writings and teachings. By the way, Jack Deere, we plan for him to come in the fall. He writes this about this passage. He says, the answer to the delay in this, the answer to the delay in receiving the Spirit in the Samaritans' reception of the Holy Spirit is more likely found in the history of the Samaritans. Throughout their history, they refused to submit to the authority of the divinely chosen leaders of Israel. By delaying the gift of the Spirit until the apostles could lay hands on them, God was once for all correcting the problem. The Samaritans would be taught from here on that they must submit to the leadership of the apostles in Jerusalem. They had always refused to acknowledge the authority of Jerusalem and instead had substituted their own centers of worship. This problem was now corrected. Now at this point in the narrative, we have a twist in the plot. Simon, who had practiced the magic, Simon sees what happens through Peter and John. They lay hands on and the Holy Spirit is bestowed. He sees this and he wants to be able to do that. We see that in verse 18. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, first of all, how did Simon know that when Peter and John laid their hands on that the Holy Spirit was given? Well, most likely... Uh, they had the same experience that the first believers did in Acts 2. They spoke in tongues, they prophesied. Most likely, that's how he knew. But it was clear. They received it. And when he sees that, he makes his nefarious offer, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, we will see that Peter has zero interest in Simon's money. His only concern is the kingdom of God, which ought to be the concern of every church, every Christian, not with money, certainly not with being able to buy the power of God or the favor of God, but only advancing the name of Jesus Christ. Peter responds to Simon in the harshest of language. Verse 20, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Now, church, that's strong language. In fact, it is so strong that it causes us to wonder, was Simon really a believer? Did he have saving faith? We earlier read that he believed and was baptized, but did he have saving faith or, or simply a head knowledge? Well, it's not completely clear. Verse 21, Peter says to Simon, you have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. I mean, that's strong language. 
And then down in verse 23, he says, For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Again, makes us wonder if he was a believer at all. Simon responds in verse 24, Pray to the Lord, pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, it's good that Simon asked for prayer, but perhaps it is not so good that he doesn't just pray himself and do what Peter said to do, that is, repent of his wickedness. The bottom line, it is not completely clear whether Simon is a genuine believer or he is uh, a someone with just head knowledge. I lean to him not being a believer, but God knows. And then the passage ends in verse 25 simply. When, now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. So Philip went down preaching the gospel. Peter and John now have gone down. And as they go back, they're preaching the gospel left and right to Samaritans, just like Philip had done. And this fulfills again the words of Jesus, the last words of Jesus in Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, but in Judea and Samaria. And the gospel continues to spread. Church, what is God saying to you and to me through this passage this morning? Three big takeaways. First, the gospel continues to spread from Jerusalem across the Roman Empire. Remember, those of you who have been with us, this is the theme of the book of Acts. The book of Acts traces the spread of the gospel from a small group of Jewish believers in Jerusalem until it has spread throughout the Roman Empire to the vast capital of Rome itself. And all of this happens by the power of the Holy Spirit through a people devoted to prayer. Last week, Guy Kasky on our staff team, our, our movement's pastor, introduced to us the BLESS acronym. If you were with us or if you saw it on Instagram, BLESS, B, begin with prayer. That is always the beginning point. God, show me who you want me to love on today. Who do you want me to reach out to, share with today? We pray with people, for people, about people. B, L, listen. Perhaps the first duty of love is to listen to people. We'd rather talk to people, most of us, but, but let's talk less and listen more. E, E with people. Now, I know we're a little bit limited right now during the coronavirus ep, uh, ep, epidemic, but maybe there's a little bit of eating you can do in selected situations. Or maybe the application is simply you go to HEB for some folks who can't get out. And you offer to take groceries and drop them on their doorstep. E. S. Serve people. The heart of loving people is to serve them. We are on the lookout, especially during this season. How can we serve somebody? And then finally, share. We don't simply want to serve people with physical and material ways or even listening and uh, sh sharing our heart, but we want to share Jesus, the gospel. People are more open to the gospel today than normally because of this crisis and the mortality that is on everybody's mind. So share the story of Jesus and what he's done in your life. Church, I know... <clears throat> that many of you have been reaching out to friends and neighbors in all kinds of ways during this time. And may God give us each one grace to be sensitive to the leadings of the Spirit as He shows us how we can serve, how we can bless, how we can love. Remember our focus during this crisis, we want to love God. and We want to trust God, not give way to fear, but trust God. God is God, and we want to love people. Trust God, love people. So that's the first takeaway. The gospel spreads, and we want the gospel to spread right now, right here, right with us. Second takeaway, let's look at this action of Simon, how he offered to buy the power of the Spirit. Simon resorted to worldly methods when he offered to buy 
the power to bestow the Holy Spirit with his hands. He was relying on money rather than on the power of God, the favor of God, the closeness with God. Now, there is no question that so many times Christians and churches, none of us are exempt, at times resort in one way or the other to worldly methods rather than to God's way. And we don't want to do that. We want to do God's will in God's way. We want to please the Lord. And if there is ever a time for a wake-up call not to resort to worldly methods, it is right now during this virus crisis. We're reminded that we cannot rely on our own efforts, our own abilities, our own network, our own resources. But rather, we want to rely upon the power of God. We want to draw close to God. We want to walk with God. We want to depend upon God. Now, how do you know if you are depending upon your own resources, gifts, and abilities, or if, in fact, you are relying upon the power of God? How do you know? Well, there is a simple, clear test. Church, if you do not pray very much, then count on it. You're mostly depending upon your own power. But if you are praying uh, throughout the day, you're pouring your heart out to God, you're praying for all kinds of things, then that is a sure sign that you are relying upon the power of God and not your own power. Prayer is the acid test of who you're looking to for dependence. Now, if we're going to depend upon God and please God, resort to God's methods, not our methods, that assumes that we're going to have to be very close to God, closer than ever. That means daily each of us meet with the Lord unhurried, time with the Lord in His Word and in prayer to draw close. It also means that we need other believers, which is a little more challenging now that we can't be uh, uh, face-to-face uh, very close to so many, but, but we still got groups of all kinds meeting online electronically through Zoom calls. And so you will not go deeper with Jesus apart from other believers. And so let us help you to, to find a journey group or your regen group or a men's group or a women's group or some kind of group to grow close together because uh, uh, we, we need each other to, st- to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. If you don't have a group, go to our website, Joe Lanzalotti, who's over our group's ministry. He was... Uh, hosting the service at the outset. You can uh, find his email address and email Joe. Okay, second takeaway. Don't resort to worldly methods. Depend on the power of God. One more takeaway. And that involves this question about Simon. Was he a genuine believer? Now, this is a, a relevant question for each one of us. Have I trusted in Christ as my Savior, or do I simply have a dose of churchianity? 2 Corinthians 13.5 says to us, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Now that's to all of us. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Now, let's look at that question. First of all, let's be crystal clear how to become a Christian. And that is simply to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. In Acts 16 a Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? And Paul responds, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now church, how could it be more clear than that? How do I get saved? Answer, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What you do when you believe in Christ, when you trust Christ, is this. You transfer your trust from yourself to Christ. You transfer your trust that you're going to be good enough to earn your way into heaven. You transfer your trust that, oh, well, I've walked down an aisle or I belong to a church, my parents were Christians. You transfer trusting yourself in any way, and you look at the cross of Jesus and say, Lord, that is my only hope. Jesus died for me. Oh, Jesus I need a Savior. You're transferring trust from self to Christ. 
That's what we do when we believe. And so let me ask you, are you trusting Christ to save you from your sin? Here's a question to help clarify. One day when you die, say you get to the edge of heaven and God says to you, on what basis, Jeff, should I allow you to come into heaven? Well, if you say something like this, well, I tried hard, or I had good works, or I went to church, or I walked an aisle, those aren't good answers, none of those. That's not what you need to say. But if you say something like this, I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior. It doesn't matter the words you say, it matters, are you believing in Jesus Christ alone to get you to heaven because he died and paid for your sins? That clarifies the matter. Now, when you examine yourself in your faith, there will also be changes in your life since the time you came to Christ. There should be some fruit, some evidence that Jesus Christ is in your life. If your life is no different now than, say, years before when you first came to Christ, that's a red flag. If your life is no different than your non-Christian neighbors in terms of values, in terms of belief, in terms of behavior, in terms of what you do with your money, what you do with your time, what you do with your uh, heart, uh, if there's no difference, that is a red flag. So let me conclude our passage this morning with this. If you are not sure where you stand, then you can be sure right now. Breathe a prayer like this. Jesus, come and save me. Come and save me. And you can count on it that God will do just that. Let me pray. <clears throat> Bow your heads with me, please, wherever you are. Jesus, we worship you and we bless you and we exalt you. Because as we sang at the outset, Lord God, you are worthy of all praise and all honor in the universe. We worship you. We bless you. Lord, if there is anyone hearing my voice who maybe thought they were a Christian, but they were really trusting their own churchianity or religion or trying hard, Lord, right now, may they come to you. May they come to you. Friend, if you're in that situation or if you're not sure, just breathe a prayer right now, something like this, Jesus, save me from my sin. I put all my trust in you. Thank you so much. Lord God, we love you and we bless you. And Lord, I thank you for every single person who has joined together online to worship you together. Bless them, oh God, I pray in every way. We pray in his name. Amen.